Hey guys, and welcome back to Uplift Fit Nutrition Radio. I'm your host, Lacey Dunn, and today we are going to talk about the limitations of research. I apologize, I have been at the Arnold Expo all weekend, losing my voice, but we are going to do this and we are going to learn anyway. So let's get started on episode three. Wow, I had such an amazing weekend at the Arnold Expo. I am, my heart is just so full. I love getting to meet you guys, getting to hear your stories, what helps you, and I freaking loved that you guys love these podcasts. I am all about learning. I'm all about spreading knowledge and proper nutrition, so I'm so excited that you guys love this. So today, I wanted to dive into the limitations of research, how to specifically read research, and what you need to look at. So when you're looking at research, The thing is that a lot of researchers only put abstract out for the public to read. The problem with this is the abstract is not the definition of the research. It is not providing you both the methods and the funding and um, specific results for this research. It is only providing you like a general summary. It's like looking when you're reading a book is like, the summary of the book except with research they are able to make conclusions that could possibly not be fully true so let's look at the limitations of research what to look at and we'll move on from there then into looking at research in our next episode I'm so excited we're gonna have Lauren Conlin on board she has she's an IFBB bikini pro she has done intensive research on NPC bikini Well, now it's IFBB bikini prep in regards to the research with it and dieting, how your body reacts. And she has also gone to an amazing conference for ketogenic dieting in relation to clinical care. So I'm super excited to have her on board. So let's dive into this research, how to read research topic, and then we will dive into specific research. With looking at research, the first thing that you want to do is look at both the duration of the study and the participants. So you want to look at if the participants for working for the a workout um, research, such as um, training differences, you want to make sure that you look at if they are untrained, trained, how many years that they have um, had workout experience because. The effect to how your body responds is different if you are a brand new person to training versus somebody who's been in the weight room for four or three or four years. You want to look at the participants. You want to look at the duration of the study, specifically because when you're looking at nutrition, the effects on the body are not, um, you don't see the long-term effect with like a four to eight week study. You see the clinical significance. Uh, Say that a study looks at the um, effect of beetroot extract on somebody's metabolic rate. That is not going to be, there's going to be an immediate effect, but you're not going to see the clinical significance for a long-term health effect in that study just by looking at it for eight weeks. And a lot of nutrition and um exercise components to research, a lot of this needs to be looked at as a long-term effect on health. And what a lot of researchers do is they they assume things when they do this research study. So you really want to make sure that you look at how long they did this study and what they were specifically looking at. You want to look at the methods. So did they test this? What did they test? Did they use DEXA? Did they use um, skin fold calipers? So with DEXA, th- the struggle is that there is not like a specific perfect use for testing body comp measurements. The DEXA is probably one of the best, but the thing is it was made to test bone density. So with body composition changes in research, we're looking at results being um, affected by water retention, carb intake, glycogen levels, supplementation. If they were adhering to the specific protocol, we don't know that. You, with studies, a lot of adherence is participants saying, hey, I followed it. You don't know 100% that somebody did. You can't just assume 
things that that is they went and they drank say that they're testing the effects of blood glucose with a fructose beverage. You are not 100% sure that this individual took that beverage that you sent them unless you were there. So you're going by, basically you're blinded and you're just trusting them. So that there's a lot of things you have to take into account when you're looking at research, you're looking at methods, and you just have to make sure that you realize what is going on. The problem with DEXA in regards to looking at hypertrophy ugh, hypertrophy studies is that gains in fat-free mass can actually be kind of covered by water gains. So if somebody hasn't specifically controlled their water intake for the day, for the week, there um in the throughout the study, that can be interpreted as glycogen gains. So that is a struggle with looking at body composition studies, looking at um, the effects with workouts or nutrition. So you just want to make sure that you look at the methods. You also want to make sure that you are looking at if they're using a human. So there have been studies that have looked at like rats or mice. Or So let's put an example of I saw a study with testing glucose and fructose and their metabolic effects but they didn't use humans they used rats and the thing is rats aren't humans I know the EPA and um, the FDA they use animal studies and they take into account the um, differences for humans and I know they use a lot of like um Blanking, guys. I'm so tired, <laughs> but it was an amazing weekend. Um, they use a lot of pesticides, herbicides. Um, they do a lot of toxic uh, ingredient studies using animal studies, and they take into account or try to take into account the differences. But the thing is, you specifically cannot assume that the human body is going to metabolize something the same exact way a rat does. It just doesn't happen that way. So you have to take that into account, too. Looking at hypertrophy studies, hypertrophy studies, <laughs> you have to make sure that you really do look at the measurements, what they're testing, what they're doing, the participants, and if they're following specifically the plan for both nutrition and training. Um, the problem is that, you know, certain researchers like Chris Beardsley, they post um, little kind of like abstract photos of what they found, what's going on. And I know for specifically like one that was looking at eccentric training and if that was greater than, um, if that causes a greater increase in muscle collagen synthesis, what they looked at um, was specifically only leg extensions. And what they did was six sets of 10 one leg knee extensions. And then they followed they had the subjects have a certain whey protein and carbohydrate drink. We don't know that the subject specifically did that. We also cannot say that, hey, this method is exactly what works for different muscle groups and for different people with different levels of training, different metabolisms. So we just, we can't come to conclusions with research always. Now, the best methods best way to look at data is going to be a meta-analysis. And what a meta-analysis is, it is a um, collab and a group of different studies and research looking at a specific topic and the effects with that topic. So it could be looking at a various number of studies with hypertrophy in regards to protein intake and protein timing. So we know that Eric Helms has done something like that, and um, even looking at his data, you have to look at the various methods and um, the way they tested and the participants. You have to look at all those things, but a meta-analysis is going to be your best bet for being able to have validity in data and be able to come to proper conclusions on a topic. I know this is sporadic, but another thing that you want to look at is the funding. Who funded this research? Is it going to be biased towards the decision of the research? So I know that Montesado has done um, research in regards to like glycophosphate, which is kind of like a toxic ingredient that we don't we don't want to ingest. But he ha they have done research on the um, proper intake values for that, and so. They specifically come up with products with glycophosphate. So you have to look at, hey, 
funding on this. Like they're funding this research to see if it's specifically detrimental to health. So you have to look at who is funding the research. Say, look at, um, so look, if you're looking at protein studies, is it being funded by a um, potential protein company, a company that um, sells like supplements such as even like clinical supplements like Nestle, who sells like, um, they sell clinical and and parental nutrition drinks. So just look at the funding. You want to look at the methods. You want to look at the participants. You want to look at everything. If you look at the funding, it is totally awesome and good when a researcher has two different labs that look at data. This is how you know that there is no bias. So that's what I love seeing when I look at research is the fact that they test something twice. That is, for me, that confirms that there is no funding bias. Looking at results, you want to make sure that correlation is not becoming causation. So make sure that they are not assuming that specifically because is a trend in data that this is specifically what happens and they are assuming why. So that is what a lot of um, researchers do with abstracts. They interpret correlation for causation, which is terrible. So a lot of researchers do is they will say hey in the abstract they will put out relation for causation they will say hey this is what happens and this is why it happens but then you look at the research and you read and you look at um both the results and their discussion and they contradict what they put in the abstract so that's why you really have to actually read the study um it's hard because There are a lot of journals that are not free online. So what I am subscribed specifically to is the Journal of like International Sport Journal of the International Society of Sports Nutrition, along with um, various other journals with Biomed Central. I'm able to read them for free. Um, EatRight.org. They let me have access to the evidence analysis library, but I know you guys don't have access to that. So that's another struggle with looking at research is you don't have access specifically to look at the results, to look at the methods, to look at the participants. So it's a struggle with reading research, but to do your best, just know that correlation becoming causation is a thing with reading abstracts. Now let's look at the types of research. So again, what I said, a meta-analysis is going to be a combination of data from different research studies. That is going to be one of the best um, processes and um, the best results combined. It's going to be like a conclusion of various different studies. Now there are different types such as a case control study. So this is typically somebody who is not um, followed for a long period of time. It's just going to be seeing one individual, how their body reacts. So case control studies, I don't like in the literature. But um, so there's a lot of case control studies on using nutrition. There's a lot for like cancer research, um, Alzheimer's disease, various um, different. And the problem is that that's one person. That is one person's metabolic effect. That is one person's um life it and you can't just assume that that's going to work for every single individual because we're all different um randomized control trials are fantastic that is one type of method that i really like seeing so they divide into two different groups and you can either have a placebo for one group which is um, a placebo is when they actually don't get the supplement but they think they are getting the supplement so say that they're testing the effects of a um pill form of let's say it's um adenine root and how it affects somebody's metabolism super random but they're going to have one group that is going to get the pill with a dandelion they're going to have another group that is going to get the pill with nothing in it so that is great because then there's no bias and um individuals don't know that they're not getting the ingredient so you're able to specifically make sure that you there is no bias to the research I'm looking at a cross-sectional study that is a defined population at a single point in time and you can't just assume that exposure and outcome are going to be the same 
for different populations that um, you can assume that somebody, a group of people in California are going to have the same exposure of something or the same effect um, as a group, say, in freaking Europe or <laughs> Florida. Like, it just doesn't work that way. So there are various different methods. You can go on... Um, I love using the FDA site to look at different things. Um, all government sites are the best for looking at data. Um, anything that is funded by the government is typically good to look at. Any journals, institutions. But again, you just want to make sure you look at the methods, participants, everything. So again, with the participants, how many years they've trained, their ages, their where they live, um, the sample size, how many people. It's research. You have to look at it all. You have to look at the time. You have to look at the methods. You have to look at the results, how they tested the results, whether they tested blood glucose or they tested um, the I'm, – I'm drawing a blank, guys. I'm so tired, but I wanted to get this out to you. So you just have to look at research. You have to interpret it. You have to make sure the correlation is not causation. So let's dive into various research topics. I'm going to make sure that throughout our journey on this podcast that we are specifically making sure we tell you guys, well, I tell you guys what we're looking at, the methods, the participants, the funding. I'm going to make sure I tell you guys what exactly is going on so that you can make sure that I'm saying is not correlation, turning into causation, and I'm never, I will never um, to a conclusion if something is not um, scientifically sound. So this will be the end of the Interpreting Research, the Limitations of Research podcast. I want to thank you guys so much for listening, for joining in with me, and I want to apologize for being sporadic, for my voice being like, I feel like I sound like a man, like nothing bad about a man's voice. But I am definitely losing it, so 16, what is it, 17 minutes of me talking has me kind of like wanting water. I feel like the Spongebob Mimi where, you know, like Spongebob is down with Sandy's little bulb, and he's like, water. I feel like that's me right now. So huge thank you to you guys again. I hope you love these podcasts. If there is anything that you want to learn about, I want to make sure that you tell me, you email me, you comment on my um, Instagram at Faith and Fit, you comment on my YouTube, which is youtube.com slash Fit and Faith, you tweet me at Lacey A. Dunn. I want to hear it. I want to know what you want to know and what you want to learn about because this is for you. This is to help spread knowledge, to help spread proper nutrition and science. So help me help you, help me teach you, and we are both going to learn together along the way. My email is fitandfaith at gmail.com if you ever want me to specifically look at a study. I am not a researcher. I am a senior dietetic student graduating in May, hopefully moving on to my master's degree. I'm not specifically the best person to look and interpret research, but I am definitely a lot better than somebody who has never read research before. So if you want a second eye, email me. I am always happy to help. I'm always happy to answer questions. I love helping. I love teaching. I love learning. So always there. Our next episode will again be with Lauren Conlon looking at her master's research and um, the ketogenic clinical dieting conference, what she specifically saw there. And the, um, so we're going to dive into that in our next episode. I'm so excited for that. So make sure you listen to our next podcast. Make sure you subscribe to my YouTube. I'm trying to put out more content there. You follow me on Instagram at Faith and Fit and you follow me on Twitter at Lacey Dunn and please interact with me. I love it. I love talking to y'all. I love interacting with y'all. I love meeting y'all. The Arnold was just incredible. I am just over the moon happy. My, the fact that I didn't get to see my cat for five days straight. That was quite depressing. So Bella is... <laughs> in my lap right now and I'm just gonna love on her thank you so much for listening and I look forward to recording our next podcast you have been listening to uplift fit nutrition radio with Lacey Dunn